Okay, it's recording. Awesome. So welcome everybody. Um, this is really exciting to have a awesome opportunity to talk with Duke medical students about their careers in health humanities. Um, thank you so much for sparing your time today to talk with us. And yeah, I'm sure it's gonna be really interesting. So to start off our day today, we wanted to have some introductions. So if each of you um, would be able to say your name, your year in medical school, um, your majors or minors in undergrad, or a little and a little about your interest in health humanities. Um, and if you need help remembering that, I can put that in the chat. But those are our questions. Would who would like to go first? Hey everybody, uh, I can start off. Uh, my name is Jacob Nast. I'm a fourth year medical student here at Duke. Uh, my, my major in undergrad was biological sciences um, and my interest in health humanities sort of uh, spawned out of my interest in photography um, and also as a way to sort of keep healthcare human and not just all about science and medicine. I can uh, take us forward from that. Uh, my name is Andreas. I am a fourth year as well, but I'm in the MD PhD program, so I'll be here forever. Um, I uh, first got interested in humanities. Uh, I mean, I'm, I've been playing music for a long time, um, but I actually did my undergrad in a totally unrelated field. I did it in uh, chemical engineering, um, but I uh, continued to play in the orchestra. And I always felt that music has a unique way of helping us express emotion. Um, I'm interested in palliative care, neurocritical care, and neurosurgery. So uh, for me, it, that communication, nonverbal communication, uh, in that way has always been something that I find really interesting and important. Um, and so I like to, at least in my exploration of the health humanities, uh, find ways to convey um, uh, feeling and emotion, like basically to give people chills with music. And I, I like doing that. So, yeah. I can go next. I'm Sonali. I'm a third year in the program, in the med, the MD program, and I'm a first year in the Masters of Population Health Sciences program at Duke, um, which is awesome. Highly recommended. Um, and I'm pulling up your chat list. Uh, when I was an undergrad, I actually went to Duke, so I majored in biology and I minored in neuroscience and Spanish. Um, interest in health humanities really started for me um, I grew up with a chronic illness. Um, I grew up with osteogenesis imperfecta, and then I, I've had lots of different mental health sequelae from there. Um, and in undergrad, I was really involved with Me Too monologues, um, if any of you are familiar with that, pro um, with that project. And so I got really interested in storytelling, and that led me to wanting to combine the two, like my experience um, being a patient with storytelling. So I'd say storytelling is my main interest and in performing. Cool. I'm Kason Robbins. I'm a fourth year med student at Duke. I'm going into ophthalmology next week, hopefully. Um, match day is Monday, so we'll see. Um, let's see. I went to school in Mississippi, small private school, uh, majored in biology and chemistry, um, but I took a semester abroad in London um, studying literature, art, uh, poetry, things like that. Uh, so that's sort of what sparked my interest, I would say, in the humanities more generally speaking. And then uh, coming to Duke, um, I was involved with the narrative medicine interest group and the history of medicine interest group as a first and second year med student. Um, so really interested in basically just any way we can connect the humanities with healthcare. I think there's a lot of ways you can. Um, I think medicine needs more humanity in it. I think that you figure that out the more time you spend in medicine. So um, that's really all I care about is getting more of it. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Alexis. I'm technically a fourth year medical student, but I took an additional year for research. So I'm not matching yet, but I will be applying into pediatrics and I want to work with children with um, chronic diseases. 
Um, in undergraduate, I majored in neuroscience and I minored in French literature and then interested in health humanities. I've always been like a writer, a dancer and involved in theater. And I feel like the humanities are just a very powerful way of expressing the human condition. Um, and I think just seeing how even an area like dance can express loss, joy, so many different things. Um, and I think medicine lends itself to so many extreme life circumstances. And I think that the humanities are a really powerful way that we process and move forward with life. Um, so yeah, I'm very passionate about that. I got to work with Kaysen on the narrative medicine interest group our first year. And just, I think humanities are an essential part of medicine. That is so great. It's so inspiring to hear about all your really diverse and interesting stories um, just in your introductions. So thank you for that. Um, and I just wanna let everybody know who's watching. Um, you're welcome to put your own questions in the chat if you'd like. We have our own um, preset list of questions, but if there are other questions at the end, then we'll have um, time for that. So yeah, feel welcome to do that. And let's see, um, Samarin, do you wanna take it away with our questions? Yeah, so um, one of our first questions for asking uh, to ask you was, how are you applying medical humanities to your medical school career? And so I can uh, uh, comment a little bit on that. So. Um, <clears throat> In terms of applying it uh, during my medical school career, so there's a student uh, initiated and student ran program called Scopes here in the School of Medicine. Um, and that is portraying the stories of patients through art and multimedia. Um, it started about, I think, a year before we matriculated to Duke. So I think it started in 2016 or so. Um, that was led, it was a completely student led initiative, you know, that came out of an interest in humanities by the, the group of med students right before us. And it accumulates with uh, a, a group of artists, of student artists who take the story of a patient that you're paired with. So in the first year uh, medical curriculum, you get an Apple partner, and that can be a community partner with a chronic illness. It can be people who have uh, problems, you know, accessing or having high utilization rates of uh, using the emergency department. It can be people who have mental health uh, concerns and issues that they're trying to get access to. Um, but the long story short is you get paired with this patient for a few sessions and you hopefully get to know about them as a person. And then uh, you can tell their story in whatever lens you want that to be through, uh, be it, you know, spoken word, uh, videos, photos, physical art pieces, uh, so on and so forth. And there's a exhibition at the end of the year where all of that work is displayed uh, along with the artist. It, you know, was live and in person before COVID and this year, uh, because of COVID, it got switched to an online gallery, and that was courtesy of a lot of work of Andreas, who's on this call and creating a great website for it. Um, but that time there was definitely moving for me to be able to dig in deep to someone's story and understand, you know, how to never lose sight of the person that is behind an illness and not just focus just on the science. Uh, and it moved me so much that, you know, I became part of the executive committee there on that to help continue to push that forward. And I hope that it continues on uh, for the years to come here at Duke. I'm hoping to stick around here uh, in radiology and who knows, maybe I'll be able to help out a little bit more in the future. I can uh, pigtail off of that uh, just because uh, uh, Jacob and I both worked on uh, scopes together on the exec last year, which was a, a fun time. Um, and I mean, of course, always both participating in scopes and uh, helping kind of curate it were both inspiring uh, moments because like you started to see uh, almost get this meta view of, of other people's experiences with patients and um, just being able to experience that art. I, I put the link to the website in the chat. Uh, please, please, please go and check it out. It's um, a labor of love from a lot of people and you start to really see the manifestation of these experiences and um, these relationships between people. Um, uh, for me, I mean, one of the, like, I'm going to be here a while. And one of the things I've been trying to do and continue as I'm in the MD and the PhD portion of my training here is like, um, continue to try and practice the, uh, kind of 
the um, sorry, the fire alarm's going off. <laughs> um, the uh, expression of emotion in music. I, I've been trying to do that for a while um, and still learning, but also um, learning to connect with people even uh, in these difficult times. I'm spending time in the intensive care unit, um, now in the neural intensive care unit, uh, just uh, you know, going and rounding and seeing patients and um, continually trying to think of uh, you know, what is important in that conversation. Um, and that's, all, I mean, this is where the art of medicine comes in. and in that art lies the ability to express it in other forms as well. I can go next. Um, so I'm a year below them. So I did scopes when I was a first year, probably either the year they organized it or after. Um, and it is such an awesome program. So if you guys are looking for, if any of you are interested in med school, I definitely recommend checking out scopes and similar programs. It's so cool. Um, in terms of how the medical humanities have been part of my med school career, um, I would say I'm really interested in medical education, like how we educate the next group of doctors. I think that's extremely important um, given all of the things that we've seen in the news over the last year, um, especially, but we know that health is really the origin of so many disparities that we see. And so the medical humanities have been such an opportunity, I think, for me to have a hand in um, sort of what these next generation of doctors, myself included, learn moving forward. So my first year, um, based off of Me Too Monologues, which is um, a social justice theater that started at um, started in Duke undergrad, um, that involves the act of anonymous people giving their story and then actors uh, taking that story and performing it as if they were their own. I thought that metaphor was really powerful for what we are asked to do as physicians, where we take a patient's story and we have to give it away. Would you like be a responsible steward of that story? And so um, a friend of my, a friend of mine who also did Me Too Monologues, um, we created an elective for third and fourth year medical students when we were um, first years that was based in the medical humanities. And so I think it's allowed me to explore my interests in like medical education and also uh, very much kept me sane. Like I'd say in my quote unquote career in med school, writing, processing, having tools to do all of these things and having like a supportive medical humanities community has helped me like reconnect with why I'm going into medicine when it's very easy to get caught up in all the flashcards and all that. So I'd say played, it's played both a role professionally and personally. I'll hop on that as well. Um, so there's sort of been two sides of this, like the activity side and the personal side. So like I mentioned, Kason and I um, came into medical school and decided we wanted to restart the narrative medicine group and really explore, um, just especially through literature and poetry, um, narratives of patients and physicians. And then on the personal side, um, I always keep a notebook and I would reserve space uh, during like my clinical rotations to just write down my feelings through just random scraps of poetry, even just journaling. And um, actually some of the things that really stuck with me um, were the concepts of, um, it's gonna go a little morbid, but a good death. Uh, that's something that you see a lot in themes in literature and it's not talked about as much in medicine. And that actually helps me springboard um, into a research project, which is part of the reason why I'm taking the extra year to do research, looking at um, measuring uh, how well we're meeting end of life wishes uh, for families of children with complex um, illnesses. And so it, it started very humanities based and now it's actually become a research project that I'm working on. Yeah, I actually took Sonali's class last year. It was really good uh, with Dr. Barfield. Um, so I would say like, I think there's a lot to say. The most important thing, like, obviously, a lot of you guys are pre-med on the call. A lot of you are interested in going to medical school. Um, a lot of you are probably interested in, like, incorporating medical humanities on a career basis. Um, but I think it's really important to consider incorporating it on a personal basis. So I'm going to really focus more on that. I really think, like, I'm going to harp on this probably. I've said it already. But I think that medical training is quite dehumanizing in some ways, like, to both patients and students. I think that it's important to sort of center yourself on um, the aspects of like medical care that are really important sort of in a metaphysical way and like in a, um, not in a spiritual way so much to say, but like 
you know, the act of healing is like, you know, something that's preserving life, that's like maintaining quality of life and like really finding like purpose in that. I think when you're in the humanities and you're immersing yourself in like the human experience of emotion, of suffering, of joy, um, I think it's a lot easier to justify your like existence as a physician. It's a lot harder to do that like when you're in the hospital dealing with very sick patients, um, dealing with sort of struggles on a day in day out basis. So for me, it's been a lot of like reflecting, um, you know, at Duke, we have really good medical humanities. Like you guys are in one of the best places you could be to do this kind of stuff. Um, so like we've had people do reflective writing workshops with us where we sort of journal our thoughts and feelings regarding patient interactions, um, mostly in the first year, but then you can continue doing that as a second, third and fourth year. Um, but also just thinking about how you talk to patients, thinking about how um, narratives influence patient care, you know, and what our preconceived biases about patients are and how those influence our care of those patients and um, just trying to broaden your experience and sort of take in more perspectives. Um, I personally am from like a very small town in Mississippi, very like um, conservative background in terms of like the people I was around growing up. I'm coming to Duke in a lot of ways. Like I met a lot of people that had a lot of ideas that I had not experienced before. And I think like I've changed a lot over the course of medical training. And I think a lot of what the humanities do for us is allow us to confront sort of our own um, presuppositions and our own ideas about things and to change them. I think that's an important part of caring for a diverse patient population in the future. Um, so I think all of that's really important. Um, I guess the last thing I would say is just, um, I had an interviewer on like a recent interview that was like, oh, you went to Duke. I can totally understand why you did the narrative medicine thing because that's all they care about at Duke is like narrative medicine and like, you know, patient experiences and stuff. And like, I'm just like, again, I think you guys are super lucky to be where you're at. And I just encourage you to like make the most of the resources and opportunities you have uh, sort of through this class and through other avenues. Thank you so much. Um, that's really interesting to hear about all that's going on at Duke um, in terms of narrative medicine and health humanities. So on a related note to what Kaysen was uh, briefly mentioned when he was talking, um, we have a question from the audience. Um, what are some of the ways that medicine is currently lacking in humanity or some ways that the pre-med and medical education um, as well is lacking in humanity? I'll just respond really quickly since I feel like I touched on it briefly. Um, I think that specifically speaking, like the amount of knowledge you have to integrate into like a schema uh, to take care of patients is vast. And I think that step one, like has historically been a big source of sort of fact-based knowledge accumulation. And step two CK will be as well, because as you may or may not know, if you follow this kind of stuff, yeah, thank you, Sonali. Step one is a big board exam um, that you have to take and it's a scored test similar to the MCAT, uh, but it will be pass fail by the time that you guys come in. So there's a little bit less emphasis placed on it. But I just think like in general, we, we focus so much of our education and learning on learning all the facts about all the diseases. And then you get into the hospital and realize really quickly, like most disease behaves differently from the textbook. I just think there's like a lot of room to not necessarily de-emphasize fact-based medical education. I don't think that's really what it is, but to, as Sonali said, like educate students in a way where like we maintain a sense of awareness and a sense of open-mindedness towards like experiences and patients. Uh, I think we do a good job of that at Duke, but I think it could be better other places um, in terms of like educating medical students. And then the way I think humanity is sort of lacking, I think that our medical system it's based on like the country we live in, obviously, but it's a largely profit-based medical system. Um, and it is like a system that excludes patients from proper medical care and stratifies patients based on socioeconomic status in terms of quality of medical care. I think all of that can feel quite dehumanizing when you like look at humanism and say like, you know, people should be treated equally. Uh, I think you don't always see that in medicine, but um, advocating for that and working towards that end goal um, is a big, reason why I love the humanities. I think it really like inspires that. Um, I think we need more of that among our administrators and our physicians alike. I think interestingly, one of the trends in the recent years, um, even like where I was, I came from in Cincinnati, uh, 
before you enter your clinical rotations, there are more things like narrative medicine interest groups. And like, um, there was an anatomy drawing uh, course, like things that are very humanities based. But once you get into your clinical rotations, those things kind of fall off because you're so focused. We have these two halves of a medical student. I feel like the humane side and the competent side, and these are both important. But when you're in the clinicals, it's so much about learning everything you can, making all the right decisions, and oftentimes your test scores, um, and nurturing that side of you that needs to process emotion, um, you know, interact with patients who have completely different backgrounds than you, understand what they're going through. That's where we really need more opportunities for students, for providers to, um, to be engaging with the humanities and their own humanity itself. Um, I think in addition to what everyone's already said so far, because I completely agree with all of that, um, another place that it that is lacking in humanity when it comes to medical training is, uh, there are so many, where to start? Um, <laughs> I'll try to pick one. Um, uh, one, I think, are all of the barriers to accessing um, a medical education um, that you end up with a pretty, you end up with a system that really favors um, some identities over others. So um, my, my example is like when I was going through the med school application process, um, one, I was told often and always like get all those really strong science courses and really show that you're a science student. And then, to, which is very different from the messaging I get from the side of actually being a med student. Um, and then two, I was told, don't write that you have any illness on any of your applications. And so I didn't, I didn't, and this is a massive part of my life. It's like something I think about every second of the day, but I was, there was definitely a perception going into medicine that um, humanity is important to recognize, but when doctors recognize it in themselves, it's somehow a weakness. Um, and while I think that that is a stigma that's changing, um, I would say that's definitely something that gets a lot of people down. So one is like physical ability and then cost. It's wildly expensive to apply to medical school. Boards are all hundreds of dollars. Um, and I think constantly being told to like feel um, grateful just to be included and kind of feeling grateful just to, you know, get to learn the material. Um, is hard when you're also going really far into debt and you're paying so much to be there. Um, so there's definitely a very confusing relationship between what is the hierarchy in medicine and what it expects from us and like how much we are supposed to give of ourselves. I think if I had to picture more humanity in medicine, it would include teaching students um, the importance of like boundaries, like boundaries between one's personal and professional life. I think that's something that's really lacking. I mean, I think that's an amazing point. I, I agree with everything that's been said. I want to emphasize that definitely medicine promotes a kind of thinking sometimes that, you know, yes, it's it helps sometimes to keep someone alive, but the thinking oftentimes is that is that of, you know, each patient is a problem or like, you know, something, something that you have to solve. And it's often attacked from that perspective. Um, and uh, like that dehumanizing aspect is um, represented throughout medicine. And on top of that, it's also represented in the way that a lot of people carry themselves in medicine. Um, sometimes, you know, th th there's always uh, examples that I've, at least I've seen a lot in the clinic of, um, th thankfully not, not much while I've been here, but um, there are always people who are very interested in medicine for sometimes maybe not the best reasons um, and who, who uh, do it more as a job than as, as I think what a lot of us are kind of indicating that it should be like a calling, something that that, that is, uh, you know, is something, a place where you connect with people as opposed to a place where you just solve problems because just solving problems doesn't allow you to best treat patients in my opinion. I mean, and another thing is that this is something that is emphasized by the way that we honestly go about a lot of our training, you know, from the existence of these board exams, which have their place, but have so much emphasis placed upon them that you can't match into certain specialties unless you have certain score, which means that you have to dehumanize yourself and memorize all these facts so you can get that score. And I'm rambling a little bit, but it's uh, the, the, the problem is so vast and so ubiquitous a lot of the times that there's so many different aspects to it that um, it, it need to be rooted out of uh, the way that we do medicine nowadays. Um, but I, I mean, I, I can't, 
I, I agree with everything that's been said. And all I will say is that being a physician um, oftentimes is, is linked with so many other things that the, the basic aspect of being there for someone is lost. Um, people get busy, all this stuff happens, but you know, at the end, it's good to think back, why are we doing this in the first place? And in the end, it's, you know, it's, it's about those uh, interactions and we lose sight of that so often, um, so. Yeah, I'll chime in a little bit here and I'd say that uh, this might sound somewhat weird, but part of being a competent physician is sometimes dehumanizing medicine. And what I mean by that is there's a lot of things that go on in the hospital and you have to be able to think just about lab values, just about data coming from a patient and you break them down into numbers. And it's not terrible to do that, but it's terrible because that's the easier way to think about things often. And people will default to that, that path and you can get stuck in that. Um, you know, healthcare is hard. There's a huge need for physicians we have a, a population in this country that's going to continue to need more and more patient care over time. And because of that, there's lack of, you know, resources and time. Um, and that can definitely push down on people. So I feel like there's a, you know, a, a utility that people do of de dehumanizing things in medicine. And you have to not lose sight of the fact that you do do that out of efficiency sake, but you need to be able to rehumanize it and never, you know, lose sight of that. Um, you know, it is absolutely true that there's a competency threshold that's looked at uh, specifically around test scores and about academics. Um, traditionally, I would say, I'd say that that tide is definitely changing in terms of the makeup of, of medical schools and applicants. There's more people that go into uh, medical school every year that have had non-traditional backgrounds, whether they've had gap years, or they have, you know, undergrad degrees that weren't considered, you know, the norm in the past. Um, so I'd say that as much, you know, as I just gave a little doom and gloom about the realities of medicine, there is, you know, a silver lining there that this is absolutely a thing that current leadership and future, soon to be future leadership is very keen and aware of, that it's crucial to, to the practice of medicine. It's so funny, there's there's this sort of change that you get between going between like a first year med student when you first get on the boards and being a fourth year or an intern when you realize how much more efficient you are when you humanize patients when you initially work them up. So when you're a first year med student, you know, part of you wants to hear all the social story and everything. And it's great when you get all that history and then you walk out and they say, hey, so what's going on with the patient? And you can tell them all of that, but you can tell them nothing about, you know, the medical reason why they're in the hospital. And then you go back in there and you ask 900 questions that are all one line things. And it's just depersonalized, it's very dehumanized. And then later on, you understand how to balance or you grow, you do things like medical humanities that make you realize you can make a narrative out of someone's story. And you can walk into a room and in 20 minutes, you know everything about them, you know about their grandkids, their pets, and you've asked them all the things that you need to know about their medical condition, like you were getting the story and listening to a friend. Yeah, thank you for all of that. Those are all really amazing stories. Um, the audience gave us a question specifically for Sonali, um, and they wanted to know uh, how specifically you explored storytelling with the health humanities focus while at Duke. So how I pursued storytelling in the context of the health humanities when I was a Duke undergrad? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, Great question. I don't think I did. Honestly, I, I, I don't think I ever, I really explored the intersection of health and the humanities. Um, I suppose it depends on how broad your definition of health is. Um, and a lot, like a lot of MeToo Monologues content was in a lot of my Spanish courses. I mean, even though, I mean, they would cover like political unrest. It covers like themes in mental health. It covers um, themes in racism and um, related topics and all of those I think very much impact health um, but when it comes to like the patient story when I was an undergrad I, I went straight through to med school I think I was really strongly just given this narrative of um, um, 
really strengthening my like pre-med application and getting in all the courses and doing really well and all those things that um, I never, and then too, I don't think there were really a ton of classes you could take. There were maybe like one or two, I remember. Um, and I was like told that my illness was um, like a weakness and definitely don't talk about it. So I, I really wish I explored it more. And I think my like really my exploration, I mean, maybe I, ex I explored it definitely personally. I wrote a lot, I journaled a lot, I read a lot of books, but um, in terms of like my undergrad career, I think it was pretty devoid of health humanities. Thank you. Um, and so um, a follow-up question for this was for all of you guys. Um, do you guys have any stories about how your work in the medical humanities has impacted your interactions with patients or with colleagues? I do actually have um, have one story where uh, I um, interacted with a patient and his family uh, um, and I actually learned about uh, like more from them, I think, than uh, about, about the humanities and how it was impactful. Um, I, I, I won't reveal any like patient information just to protect the patient and family, but um, he came in and he had really bad infection. Um, and he wasn't doing very well. Uh, he uh, was, uh, uh, he used to teach English. And so I actually, on my first day when I, when I had him as my patient, I introduced myself and we talked and we, we found out we liked some of the same poets. I love Alexander Pope and he loved Alexander Pope and we we're like, oh my gosh, it's a cool connection. So I literally brought a book that I had found in an old bookshelf, like a bookstore, like five years prior to him and said, here's a book of Pope's poetry. Which one's your favorite? And uh, he, he had it there and he read it and all this stuff. And it was, it was awesome because we had this one thing in common. We could really connect on it. And so he was there for a couple of days, but he started not to do so well. Um, so at some point uh, we decided that, I mean, it didn't seem like he was going to be leaving the hospital. It was really bad. And uh, he started not to be himself. So we called his son who also teaches English, who came um, and uh, this patient actually passed away overnight, but his son sent me a letter uh, written on an old fashioned typewriter. Um, he had read his father, uh, the epistles from Alexander Pope as he was passing away um, and thought that it had actually given him comfort in those final moments. And um, I mean, it's something I still remember. I have the book, I have the letter, I have everything. Um, and uh, just kind of dug in the concept that like these, this is not only a way to like connect with people but also is a common language where we express ourselves as humans, right? Um, it's the essence of being a human is being able to really um, engage in this sort of uh, non-scientific and you know, uh, enjoyment of, of things that are beautiful in the world. Um, and uh, it's been a constant reminder of what really is important, which is you know, that connection with people. I think um, one of the perks of being a med student is that you have a lot more time with patients than um, other people on the team. And uh, I think the way that the medical communities have contributed to me is that um, with really like practicing storytelling and practicing listening, I think listening has been like one of the most valuable things that the medical humanities has taught me, like how to listen and what to listen for and how to listen for like nuance in people's voices and how to pick up on what people mean underneath their words. Um, it's not a super specific thing, but I think like, for example, um, one time when I was on PEDS, I was on hematology, oncology. So um, there is a kiddo who was just diagnosed with cancer. And um, I remember I really connected with the family because the daughter had just been diagnosed with depression on top of it. And a lot of the thoughts, she was really, she was probably like 10 or 11. And a lot of the thoughts she was going through were like, how do I deal with this chronic illness? Like her prognosis was great, but I think it was kind of like the isolation of having an illness. And I think being able to hear that 
she was going through something that I had gone through at one point given it's completely different disease but at least being able to like see myself in that person and like draw connections between our stories um I think it led us to have a lot of like really really powerful and like close conversations to where we were very like attached by the end of it um not always the best thing but um because they're gonna leave but um I think it allowed me to like really connect and understand her like medical issues better because she was really comfortable like opening up to me um and as you can imagine not like all 11 year old girls are happy to like open up to anybody so it was um it was very special to me Yeah, I felt like the one rotation that really emphasized like the interpersonal dynamic of medicine is psychiatry. I think there are other people who are much more interested in psychiatry here than I am that can talk to it more. But I think um, it's it's nice to have a rotation where you're allowed to put the patient story into a note and encouraged to actively. Um, I spent a lot of time taking care of kids. Um, we did like the child psych consult service. Um, and we have like a pediatric autoimmune encephalitis clinic. And then there's, um, which Alexis has worked in. So I, I won't try to like speak too much about that. But, um, you know, I had a patient who um, was a transgender patient that like was not affirmed by their parents um, that was in the ICU, um, very, very sick. And it was just like this like cacophony of like, like mental and like physical turmoil and especially like relating between the team and the family and the patient. The patient was a minor obviously. So then there's like the legal aspect that comes in and like what you can and can't do as a physician. And I found that like, um, like the patient just loved to play the ukulele and we were able to like get a ukulele in the room. And like, that was the one thing that made them like feel safe and feel at home. I think like in, within the Duke hospital, there's a lot of ways that you can sort of connect patients with those resources. Like we have like an arts and health team um, that can like get people supplies to like draw or paint like in the hospital, maybe not as much with COVID. I, I haven't been in the hospital really since COVID started. So I'm not sure, but um, and like musical instruments and for kids like games and stuff. So I think like one way to think about like humanizing medicine is just like making the hospital experience like more attuned to like things that people actually do outside the hospital and things that they enjoy and things that they care about um, because that didn't hinder this patient's care at all for them to like have a ukulele in the room like we were still able to do everything we needed to do um, but in a moment of like a lot of stress um, on that patient like that was able to bring a lot of joy so I just think like if you're interested in that I really think even though some people have differing opinions in Atul Gawande, like I really think he has a really nice book uh, called Being Mortal that talks about like nursing homes and sort of making like the process of dying more human um, and how like cold and sterile it can be for people to die in a nursing home. I just think that's really like how I feel about the hospital. Um, and Victoria Sweet, I think it's God's Hotel. God's Hotel. Uh, God's Hotel, yeah. She talks a lot about um, a couple of different hospitals, like historically and um, sort of in the more present day that have taken an approach to like slow medicine and really caring for patients organically and naturally, um, not in sort of a naturopathic sort of way, but in a, um, in a more human way, I think. So if you're interested in those topics, you know, I can put those books in the, um, they're both older books. I haven't read anything in a couple of years because I'm a med student, um, but I can put those uh, books in the in the chat because I think they both do a good job of conveying like materially the things that make up our hospital system are very dehumanizing and we could do something about that to make them feel more akin to normal life. I think the uh... I want to tell so many stories just about like patients because I feel like that's what this is all about. Like, you know, as an institution, we may be struggling to figure out how to incorporate the humanities, but our patients just like they, this means so much to them. But um, one thing that comes to my mind was actually, um, this is going to sound hilarious, but there's a transition place from children who are uh, born premature, they're in the NICU, and there's transition to when they get to go home. Um, and I got to do a rotation there. And what I remember was how they would do the sweetest little things. Like there was uh, a gentleman who played, I want to say clarinet, and he would come every day and play to these kids. 
And if children were, um, if their parents wanted, especially if the kids were having a really rough time, they would come in and do like clay handprints and like the footprints and like those art projects that, you know, often get to do with your kids at this age when they're in the hospital. And um, that really taught me the value of like asking for those things for my patients. Like um, on another rotation, I got to ask for a patient to have pet therapy and they got to cuddle with a golden retriever. And that just like made them super, super happy, not directly humanities, but it's part of being humane. <laughs> um, and so it was just like all those little things that um, as a medical student, you can think about that your residents um, might not. And so it's just, it really matters. Great, thank you so much for those stories. Those, they're so impactful and really great to hear from you. Um, our next question we also got um, is, um, what would you say is the value in medicine for having a kind of non-STEM major in undergrad once you become a medical student? And along with that, if you had any, you know, specific classes that you took in undergrad that kind of um, inspired you in um, your medical career? That's the question. I'm debating if I should share this one because you guys are going to laugh, but um, I took a class called the European Vampire. Um, this was my senior year going nuts class and it started as a very like literature based class, but underneath that there was this deeper message of how we as a society see otherness. And one thing in particular was um, like how a lot of things we create in the humanities are representations of our fears. Um, and that's actually really helped me as a medical student to have that perspective in reading. Uh, I think it's incredibly valuable to continue reading fiction, reading narratives, reading all these things, because it gives you a perspective on fears that you have, fears that other people have. And I think that helps when you're faced with a patient who might be reacting in fear or a resident or a colleague who's reacting in fear or in anxiety, you automatically are learning, you have been learning um, to empathize with, that, empathize with them, to start asking yourself the deeper question of what's, what's going on, where, um, what do they need in this moment? And I think that's just a really powerful thing to try to practice as a human. And I would definitely encourage you guys. It's hard in medical school, but keep reading, keep doing that. I think the value of doing a non-STEM major is immense. Um, I, I think the benefit of doing a STEM major is that you come in with a good scientific foundation that I think honestly you'll get if you do all the recommended pre-med courses because um, you have to do those anyway. Um, and maybe if you do, a, what I've heard from my, some of my friends who have done non-STEM majors is that they probably felt a little bit more insecure kind of during our first year time, our preclinical time when we were learning a lot of science really quickly. But um, honestly, a lot of them are much better than me now at a lot of sciencey stuff because all the sciencey stuff is really a lot of facts and it's not super complicated, it's just a lot. So I honestly think you can learn a lot of that when you get to med school. What I think you can't really learn when you get to med school or what you don't really have as much time to learn is to like go deeply into these humanities topics. The most valuable classes to me in undergrad, um, there were two or three. One was, I forget what it's called. I also forget the name of the instructor, but it was a course on social activism. It was almost like the basics of social activism. It was like analyzing um, social movements through time. And, um, as like we've all mentioned, the, the what is happening in society is such a big impact on people's health that I think it was so valuable to learn about those things from the out from outside of health. Just like how do people organize movements and what what toll does that take on people and how do they manage it and all those sorts of things. So um, that was a really great maybe just life book or sorry life class. Um, and then the other really valuable class I took um, was a Spanish class. Um, though I'm sure there is some um, English speaking equivalent where we actually went into um, almost actually every Spanish class I took where we went really deeply into religion. 
The one that I'm thinking of is um, we went into indigenous religions um, and that was an awesome class. If any of you are Spanish minors, um, but any class, so I'm not a super religious person um, and I grew up Hindu, um, but I think uh, grappling with like spirituality and going through a class where we're learning about spirituality and we're learning about religion and what the difference is and how it makes you reflect on your own. And then I think it made me a lot more comfortable to talk to patients when it came to things like spirituality, like, why are we here? And for a lot of patients, they're thinking through like, why am I ill? Why is this happening to me? Um, so even though not even all patients by any means are religious, it made me a lot more comfortable in those conversations. Um, and so that was a really valuable class for me. Yeah, I will go on record on this recorded call as saying that most pre-med prerequisites are um, unnecessary. I think that um, there's, a, so Duke is a special case, right? Like we do all of our preclinical sciences in one year. We significantly accelerate the curriculum like compared to other med schools and really just cover a ton of information in almost no time. And I know very few people that like were not able to get through it regardless of their academic background you could argue there's some self-selection like duke med students they must be really smart like but i just think that the the process of spending four years learning the things that you will learn for the next four years is really a waste of some of the best years of your life in my opinion um i think two things like one I would certainly emphasize your training in the humanities prior to your training in medicine, because I think that once you're in it, it's very difficult to sort of like commit to both while you're in it. And then after you're like, you have a job and like a career. So I think that really like going deep into the humanities first is like a more just realistic way to go about immersing yourself. And I also think that being a physician is sort of like a character profession in a lot of ways. I think that building your character by sort of knowing who you are, where you stand, what you believe, and really like diving into the humanities is a super important part of being a prerequisite for medicine, honestly. And then the other thing I would say is just like, I think that, I don't know how to say this. Um, I, I, won't, I won't go there. Anyway, in, in short, I would say like, for me, like I spent the last semester of my college in London doing the program that I talked about where I literally did nothing for three months, but go into art museums and think about architecture and think about painting and think about like theater. I saw like 60 plays or some nonsense like pre COVID. I wish that we could do that again. Um, and I think it just, it forces you to stop and think about why you're doing what you're doing. I think that's super important self-reflection to have before you enter into a training career that will take you like a decade of your life or more. Um, in some cases. So again, just super important to like have things nailed down um, to be really like well-versed in the humanities and to have a passion for it before you enter into the grind that can be uh, medical education. I'll say one thing. I was pretty far from a humanities major in undergrad. Um, I, I was very much on the technical side and the math side and I love that stuff, but um, I, I do, I, I will say that, uh, you know, the benefit of doing, uh, I mean, first and foremost, I'm gonna agree with everything everybody said that literally what classes you take do, does not really play into how well you do in medical school. Like your, your success in organic chemistry has uh, pretty much zero correlation with your success on any of these exams. I mean, I can tell you that straight up. I did not do very well in organic chemistry. Um, but uh, what I will say is that you know, being able to do what, what you truly enjoy in, in these years is I think extremely important because you find yourself and especially doing stuff in the humanities, you explore who you are uh, as a person too, which I think is also important to being a good physician is, is understanding who, who you are as a as the person and what is important to you. Um, so I, again, th th there is benefit to both. There's benefit either way. And I think for every person, it is different. Um, and what I would say is, you do not need to be an engineer or a biologist or even anything in the school of sciences to be a physician. Um, when you get to medical school, they will train you to do what you need to do. Um, so uh, it may not feel that way, but that is that is what is true because they teach you everything. Uh, it's uh, it's a grind, but you get it. So I'll, I'll stop talking there. But that's my thought.
Yeah, I guess I would just add in, you know, there's <clears throat> there's a, a very small core competency of science that you need in, in college and in undergrad that is, I'm not going to discount it. It's definitely crucial to a foundation to build upon in, in medical school, especially in places that have an accelerated curriculum. It's not impossible, you know, to do it with, with a, a very small amount of that, but you still need that component. And that will make you a competent clinician. But to be a great doctor, you know, the type of doctors that we need, I think people that don't pursue a pure STEM uh, major are the ones that are those. Some of my classmates that I respect the most that I would want to be my family's doctor are the ones that came from non-traditional backgrounds. Um, and, you know, and it just, it lends an additional diversity to medicine. There's a lot of, you know, shortcomings in the diversity of medicine in the United States, um, both in, in racial and gender backgrounds, but then also in literally like the paths that people take. And, you know, we need super smart people that take all the science classes and are going to do amazing work in labs, creating, you know, the next therapeutics and, and things like that, that clinicians are going to use, but then the day-to-day face-to-face time, the people that are in the trenches there in the hospital, you know, it's the ability to relate to patients that I think a lot of things that are not taught in a science class is where that, that comes through. Great, thank you. Um, so we are at 7.30, but we have one more question to ask from the audience. And it's, um, do you think the issues described regarding the lack of humanity in medicine is related to the disparities present in achieving a medical education? And if so, how? In part, yes. Um, I think the I think the, dis, um, the lack of humanity in medicine is due to many things and it would be hard for me to summarize them, but I think in part that it was built by, um, and this, uh, this is something I've thought about a lot as a woman who's interested in going into surgery. It was built by white men, the whole, the system, the system of residency, medical school, all of that. Um, it was not built with how can we make sure a woman during her most reproductive years can have children if she wants to and still do this career? Um, so I think in part, um, a lot of that is uh, due to medical training and the people who created the system. Yeah. Um, and I think another thing is if you have, if honestly the lack of, like if I had, if there were more people in medicine who were sick or who had ever been a patient, um, that would be great. Um, because medicine for me, even with like my current class, it's a lot of people who like run marathons and are awesome. And like, we're athletes. And that is so great because like, they're usually really mentally healthy people. And, um, but at the same time, um, it's not a lot of people who have experienced illness. So I think that would make a big difference. I think also, I mean, just to, I mean, agree with all of that and to tack on to it, the, uh, the um, how would you say, crucible that is medical education um, does not help in terms of fostering the continuing mental health and, and wellness of physicians that make their way through it. Um, and as a result, you know, you end up with people who are, who oftentimes will do the job well, but oftentimes also um, get there after having gone through this really arduous process right now. It's, it's changing, it's getting much better. I would not have wanted to be a medical student 20 years ago and I'm glad that I'm a medical student now, but it's, it's, it's a process. And just the fact that it is like this also acts as a deterrent for people who would probably be great physicians and just don't want to go through all the craziness that is modern medical education. And so I, I definitely think that the way that it is, exists now needs to change. Um, and thankfully we're seeing some movement, but you know, we need some more momentum. Um, and I, I don't know, there, there's just, there, as in anything, as in any career, there are always issues uh, when it comes to um, ensuring that you have diversity and that you have equity in the people that you have ultimately pursuing that profession because you get some of the world's greatest doctors waiting right now in middle schools and high schools and colleges all over the U.S. that either don't know about the opportunities that they could pursue, don't have the funds to go through with it, or 
um, don't think that it's for them. And this is where like, you know, sometimes it's, it's our job to show people that, hey, you can do this. It's, it's, it's something that is totally within your, your capacity. And I think a lot of what I'm interested in actually outside of, of even the humanities is like this mentorship portion, portion of it, making sure that people who are like, who are outside of the realm of medicine right now realize that it is, a, is an exciting place to be. And it's also a place where you can be a human being and, and continue to be so. It is a, a continuing struggle, but uh, getting much better. Yeah, I'll be super quick because I know we are probably running up on time, but my wife is actually a PhD in history. So like a big portion of what I like care about um, is history. And that's what I talk about every day. Um, I think that I'm sure you guys do this in this class. And if not, then like take some time to read on your own. But I think you really just have to understand the history of medicine in general. Uh, and once you do, like you understand exactly why we are where we are now. Um, there's like, I mean, it used to be a very like, humanities focused specialty back when we didn't know anything and then it became very scientific and like intellectual whenever we started to know things and then it became very commercial whenever people realized it can make a lot of money and I think like there's these phases of medicine and like our current like system is a major product of like where we've come from and I think sort of to some degree by like structure and by things that can't necessarily be changed easily or quickly but also by the people that have been put through the process right like when Flex Center made his like medical report on what medical education should look like, we still do exactly essentially what he said we should do, and that was decades ago. Um, I think that medical education in general has been quite stagnant, like for the last maybe 50, 60 years, especially. And as Andrea said, like it's better, it's more humane now. We actually have limits on how many hours we can work. Um, we, we don't live in the hospital anymore. Um, but I think that there's going to have to be a balance, I think, moving forward in the future, both to draw people into medicine, like to recruit people into the specialty of medicine. Um, I, th I think the other thing to think about too is there's other avenues into healthcare now. Like you could be a PA, you can be an NP, you can be a nurse. Um, I think that there's there's different routes for different people with different sort of priorities in life. But I think what's going to be really important is maintaining the humanity in the physician route, which is like the most arduous and most like traditionally difficult. Um, I think there's a lot of sentiment of like, it was hard for me, so it'll be hard for you. Um, I think that's starting to go away as like younger faculty take on positions of power. Um, but we're just, a, we're just a specialty that's very hierarchical and kind of stuck in the past, honestly. And I think a lot of that is because of where we've come from, like sort of the power that medicine has had, like in the 70s, 80s, 90s, you know, like how physicians are like revered um, for their knowledge. I think that we're just moving into a different world in medicine, honestly. I think that um, we will be a part of making that change and sort of ensuring that patients are prioritized and um, that our mental health and wellness is prioritized. Um, I think you all will be a big part of that too if you choose to, to come into the specialty. I also want to be quick so you respect everyone's time, but the one quick thing I, I don't think we really mentioned this is, I mean, I think everybody's been hinting at, but accessibility. Uh, accessibility of medical education is huge. Um, from some of the background that I have, which I'm not gonna go into super much, um, both the humanities and medicine as a, a career are not accessible to a huge portion of our society. And I think that, you know, if we could educate our future doctors in the humanities, that would be really great. And the hard thing is we're not educating a majority of the students in our public schools on the humanities or even telling them they have the possibility or giving them the means to pursue a pre-medical career. So um, I think, one big reason why I'm saying this is because you guys are the future in this too. And I think if we can all be striving for that accessibility, we can change quite a bit about medical education and the world really. Wow. Um, thank you so much to all of you for your amazing contributions to all these questions. This really has, at least for me, you know, as an aspiring a uh, medical student one day just really given me so much hope. Um, and I'm sure that that sentiment has been shared by a lot of other people on this call. Um, so thank you all so much for what you're doing. Um, it looks like a few other of our panelists are kind of putting contacts or other comments in the chat. So um, please check that out and um, we'll have this recording out um, in a few weeks, but 
thank you all again so much for your time and have a great night. Thank you. It was a pleasure to be here. Very nice to meet you all. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks everybody. Thanks for having us.